Hello, friends. This is Dave Hurwitz, Executive Editor at ClassicsToday.com, here with Audiophile Inanity, something I talk about periodically because so many of you say, oh, what equipment do you listen on? And I can't imagine why anybody cares. What matters is, you know, I listen on good equipment. I listen on whatever equipment makes the music sound good to me. You should listen on whatever equipment makes the music sound good to you. Nowadays, music is so portable. You know, it used to be we would sit in our listening room in a chair like this. Actually, I never did that. I always laid down and usually read a book. But, you know, we have our speakers surrounding us and our high-end equipment. But nowadays, we have we have ear pods and and iPhones and, and, and pod things. And, you know, we listen to the music in the car. We listen to it everywhere. And the truth is, we get really basically decent sound. We really do. I mean, overall, it's kind of it's kind of nifty, you know, how good we get, considering how we're handling it. Now, of course, audiophiles have a nervous breakdown because they think you still need to be in, you know, your your eggshell padded cell with your, you know, high end nuclear speakers and independent amplifiers and all that. And I've seen all that stuff. I've been through it. I have absolutely been through it. And some of it is magnificent. It can be fabulous absolutely fabulous and i've heard surround sound systems i mean i've i've been to several audio demos and i actually wanted to tell you about a couple of them just because it was fun it was really fun one of the 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 biggest trends was surround sound remember surround sound i mean it's still around home theater systems they've sort of quietly gone away although i mean they still exist of course and some people like it and you know, and, and, and some of the labels are still making things in surround sound. Most of the time, the surround sound stuff sounds just horrible, at least with classical music. It sounds horrible because they actually record things with like the orchestra behind you. And, you know, or they, what they did was, well, I went to one of the, one of the surround sound demos. It was, it was for Philips. Philips recordings. They were doing SACD surround sound way at the dawn of time. And in those days, record labels actually cared about what critics thought, you know. So we'd go on a road show. They would go on a road show and we'd come and they would sometimes serve snacks. In fact, I knew I knew that the record industry was was, was tanking when the snacks got lousy. They used to have a beautiful, I mean, Harmonia Mundi was the best. They had, I mean, they were French. They had a beautiful, beautiful banquet. Well, the last time the last time I went to one of their road shows, all they had was fruit salad. And I knew that the record industry was doomed. Absolutely doomed. But anyway, this was back in the day. They had like, you know, shrimp cocktail. So it was, it was still, it was still, they were putting some money behind this stuff. So we're sitting there in a room. And the room that you're usually sitting in is usually not set up for sound. It really isn't. I mean, it's some like hotel you know, meeting room or conference room, somewhere like that. And it's not an acoustically ideal space, not by any stretch of the imagination. <clears throat> Sometimes they could get themselves into like a, a high-end audio shop, but those rooms were too small for the number of people they wanted to bring. So we're sitting in this room and they've got, you know, speakers in every corner. And what they were playing, because in those days, they didn't actually have surround sound. I mean, they didn't have new recordings. What they were doing was reissuing all of the old quadraphonic stuff um, in remastered surround sound. Now, remember quadraphonic? Quad, as we called it, four speakers. That's what it was around the room. It was supposed to give you a surround experience, but it wasn't, it was not, first of all, it was never designed for classical music because nothing is ever designed for classical music. And quad works perfectly well with popular music because it doesn't matter where the instruments are. It doesn't make any difference. You're not trying to create a coherent sound of an orchestra recreating the acoustic space in which the orchestra was sitting with the orchestra in front and everything, you know, and, and resonance coming from the back. They, they, that wasn't what they had. So they're playing these recordings. And oh my gosh, they sounded so terrible because the instruments were all coming from the wrong spots. And, you know, an orchestral piece, when it is broken down and it decoheres like that, when the orchestral image 
is is completely destroyed. It sounds so wrong, and not only does it sound wrong, but but it, the timing is off. Everything sounds like rhythmically it's a little bit off kilter. Oh, it was just awful. So that was one fabulous thing, and I don't couldn't understand. And we said this to them. We said, you know, why are you doing this? I mean, just because you can. I mean, because they have SACD technology. They can make surround sounds. But they also didn't have the fifth channel. You know, it was 5.1. They only had four channels. And so they, they had to gin up the fifth channel and stuff. And sometimes they were three. I don't know. It was all just nuts. So that was, that was one experience. Another marvelous experience was um, when I went to see this. this they, I don't even know what this thing was called. It was it was invented by a high end audio company, who who shall remain nameless, and it was called something like the the audio audio something et like puffet or or bassinet or something like that. It had some weird name, and it looked like it looked like a footstool, and you put it in the middle of the room, and what it was supposed to do was make your lousy recording sound better. You could dwiddle knobs and things and and improve the horrible recorded sound. And this was hilarious because their their case in point, their example, their exemplar of how wonderful this technology was, which promptly vanished, I don't think it ever got off the ground, was to make Glenn Gould's Bach sound like a Bosendorfer. Now, Glenn Gould had very specific ideas about what he wanted his piano to sound like. He had a piano. It was his Steinway. Some of you know which one, a Steinway number, whatever it was, 243, who knows. It had a number. It was the one he always used. Sometimes it was in better shape than other times. And he wanted a very dry, detaché acoustic so you could hear all the counterpoint with maximal clarity and all of the articulations. So they took Glenn Gould's Goldberg variations, you know, or one of those recordings, and they fed it through the bassinet, and out it came, sounding glowing and honeyed like a Bosendorfer Grand Imperial. I mean, it was horrible. <laughs> it was absolutely not what Glenn Gould is supposed to sound like. And so, of course, they had the Q&A, and a bunch of us in the classical music wing um, raised our hands and said, what are you going to do about the fact that the artist had a very strong idea about what he wanted his recordings to sound like? And we don't want every piano to sound like your idea of what a Bosendorfer sounds like. We want every piano to sound like what the pianist and his engineers wanted the piano to sound like. And they just looked at us and basically said, so why are you here? And we said, because you invited us. You had snacks. And the snacks were pretty good. But aside from the snacks being pretty good, you know, what, what, what is this? Well, anyway. Um, so that was, that was that one, that delightful experience. Then there was my all-time most horrifying moment as a critic. And this one was really astonishing. This was at the, this is not an audiophile event specifically. Although, of course, you know, the labels were always pushing. This was EMI. EMI, American EMI, um, which was a nice company, I have to say. I mean, for a while, you know, it depended on, you know, they were all revolving doors and they had some nice people for this particular round of stuff. It was the year that Inescu's Oedipe was issued because that was like the big feature strange music title. And oh, it's a wonderful performance, by the way. And, and so they were featuring Oedipe. I mean, you know, who would do that now? Really, who would do that now? So they go through their presentation of the year's upcoming releases, and then they have the Q&A, and there was an editor of a prominent audio magazine, which tanked rather quickly thereafter, fortunately. Um, and again, he shall remain nameless. And during the Q&A, the editor of this audio review magazine raised his hand, and I thank, thank heavens that I did not write for this magazine extensively. I wrote for all of them at one point or another, but he raises his hand and says, why don't you tell us which your best recordings are so that we can feature them accordingly? Well, if that didn't suck all the oxygen out of the room, um, you know, those of us who were real critics turned around and looked at this guy 
and just said, what the hell are you talking about? You know, we're supposed to tell them, <laughs> you know, like, what are you talking about? What do you mean? Why would you say that? Why would you tell that to these people? Oh, I was so embarrassed. I was so embarrassed. I mean, it was like, it was like a horror show. I felt my, 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 my profession just, just tanking from around, around me. I knew that the criticism would never be the same again after that, that particular road show. It was, it was inexpressibly bizarre and uh you know but that's what that's what was happening with criticism because in those days at the it, 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 when the the cd era erupted they were talking about the late 80s and up to like the mid to late 90s there was so much money in the record industry even the classical piece so all of these magazines started reviewing CDs and classical stuff because they were getting ad money. I mean, the way these magazines made, made a living was getting advertising revenue from the actual labels. And when the labels had money, they, they just threw money at these people. And that created for a brief period of time in the United States anyway, I mean, maybe five years, there were something like six, seven, eight, nine, ten 10 review magazines all covering the same stuff and all getting advertising. Now, of course, the advertising, the tap got cut off in about 15 minutes. Everyone got fired. All of the labels had new managers. They all got replaced. All of that stuff happened. And then um, there was nothing left. It was absolutely, <laughs> they all disappeared as quickly as they'd popped up. But they were in competition with each other. And so it was not surprising that this particular editor, who was not the brightest bulb in the classical chandelier, wanted to do whatever he could to suck up the most advertising revenue. I mean, that's what it really boiled down to. I was, I was appalled, absolutely appalled. But anyway, and those are, those are three wonderful, wonderful moments. And I will close with a fourth, which was another speaker demonstration. This was a purely audiophile demonstration by some company I don't remember what company either. I really just don't remember. I mean, it was, these were big. I mean, this was, this was, this was unbelievable. You needed like a breeder reactor to power these speakers. I mean, you turned them on and the lights in New York dimmed. They were powerful. And, and at the beginning, they handed out a program. I may have told this story before, but ah, what the hell, we'll do it again. Um, of, of all of the incredibly wealthy people who were their clients. I mean, this was, you know, who bought these speakers. And my favorite, my favorite client of this company was Idi Amin. Oh, there were two of them. One of them was Idi Amin, pardon me. You remember Idi Amin, <laughs> you know, the dictator of Uganda, or whatever it was. And the other one, which was even better, was Baby Doc Duvalier, the former dictator of Haiti. So, so, you know, it's like you were wondering who they sold because these things were like $20,000 a piece. And this was 30 years ago. I mean, these were expensive. And, and, you know, and I would say to myself, who buys these things? Who wants a sound system like that? Well, now I know. Now I know. Ex-dictators living in retirement in the French Riviera. They got to have a sound system and they only want the best. So there you go. I, mean, I just, I couldn't believe that a company would put these names on their brochure. That's what blew my mind. I mean, you know, I can understand. It's like Hitler, Stalin, Chairman Mao. Yes, they all use our speakers. So should you. <laughs> it was phenomenal. Absolutely phenomenal. So anyway, I just wanted to have a little chat, you know, just a fun little chat about some of these, these, you know, entertaining experiences I've had in my peregrinations through the world of, of audiophile mayhem and classical music insanity and the record biz. It was quite something for many, many years. Now it's, it's all gone. It's all gone. All we have are the memories. So keep on listening, friends. Thanks so much for joining me. Take care.